everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Jennifer Gillick, and I am the program director at the Northwest Chapter of the American Parkinson Disease Association, or APDA for short. We are so glad you could join us for today's presentation about Parkinson's disease and the eye. We are thrilled to have Dr. Stephen Hamilton here with us today. He is a neuro-ophthalmologist. For those of you who don't know, Neuro-ophthalmology is a subspecialty of both neurology and ophthalmology and requires specialized training and expertise in problems of the eye, brain, nerve, and muscles. Dr. Hamilton spoke about this subject a few years back and I learned so much I wanted to bring him back. So thank you for being here, Dr. Hamilton. Before we begin, I would like to recognize the sponsors of this program. Gold sponsor, Synovian, and Kiowa Curran, and bronze sponsor, Allergan. Thank you so much for valuing these educational programs and for your financial support of APDA. We cannot do these types of programs without you. I would also like to thank those of you who are here who donated to our organization when you registered. We truly appreciate your support. If you missed out on an opportunity to do so, APDA is currently in the middle of a campaign that runs through next Wednesday, November 18th. That campaign is to fund our local Parkinson disease registry. And we could really use your help, not necessarily as a donor, but that's okay too, but as a fundraiser. The registry connects our Northwest research community to study participants, which really helps research happen faster. It's a very worthy cause and APDA is the sole funder of this registry. And we hope that you'll participate. It only takes a few minutes to register and another few clicks on Facebook or to send out some emails to friends and family. We'll put a link to that in our chat and you can also find it at our website. So for those of you that don't know, APDA is the largest grassroots network dedicated to fighting Parkinson's disease. At APDA, we strive to provide support, education and research that will help everyone impacted by Parkinson's disease live life to the fullest. Our website has a vast amount of information, including an array of educational articles, information about upcoming programs, exercise classes, and local community resources. We'll put our website in the chat as well as our phone number, so please feel free to connect with us. And now for today's program. This program, so you all know, is being recorded it will later be posted on the APDA Northwest YouTube channel. And I will also share the slides from this program with you in a follow-up email. Dr. Hamilton's presentation will be followed by a question and answer session. You can pose questions to Dr. Hamilton at any time during the presentation by typing it into the Q&A box located probably at the bottom of your screen. And now let me introduce to you Dr. Stephen Hamilton. Dr. Hamilton practices at Swedish Neuroscience Institute at Swedish Medical Center in Seattle, Washington, and is a clinical professor in the ophthalmology and neurology departments at the University of Washington Medical Center. He completed his neurology residency at the University of Washington and a clinical fellowship in neuro-ophthalmology through Harvard University at the Massachusetts Eye and Ear Infirmary in Boston, Massachusetts. He's the member of Nordic, which is the Neuro-Ophthalmology Research Disease Investigator Consortium, and he has participated in multiple national clinical trials. And in his leisure time, he enjoys road cycling, traveling, studying French, and listening to jazz piano. Thank you so much for being here, Dr. Hamilton. Thanks, Jen. Can you hear me fine? Yes, we can hear you great. Okay, so the, the title is how... Um, Parkinson's affects a person's, a patient's vision. And I, I know that a lot of folks have told me that they go to their eye doctors and tell them they have Parkinson's and, and the eye doctors often say there's not a whole lot that can be done and that they're not always aware of how Parkinson's can affect vision. So I'm gonna rely on you to sort of pass on the information to your optometrists and ophthalmologists as well. Um, and uh, hopefully you'll get something out of this and you'll be able to share that with your own eye care providers. 
So first, just a quick overview, and I know most of you are familiar with these facts, that Parkinson's is very common. There's a million Americans, at least with it, 60,000 new patients every year, and it's a worldwide disease, 10 million people worldwide with Parkinson's. And of course, we know now that it's not just older folks that get Parkinson's, that 10% of patients are under 50. And you're very familiar with all the usual motor symptoms like tremor, rigidity, slowness of movement, poor balance. But what you may not be aware of is on the next slide, the visual complaints. These are the things that I hear in my practice from my Parkinson's patients and the things that we see on the exam that can impair your vision every day. So uh, three-fourths of Parkinson's patients do have abnormal signs in terms of the movement of the eyes that are typical of Parkinson's. About the same number of patients have symptoms of blepharitis, which is a low-grade inflammation of the eyelids that can cause blurry vision, sticky eyelids, discomfort. Uh, Two-thirds of patients have dry eyes, so that results in blurring of vision that fluctuates during the day. The cornea it does about a third of the focusing before the lens of the eye. And if the cornea, which is like a clear sponge dries out, the vision will get blurry and the glasses will not correct it if you have uh, abnormal uh, tear formation of the eyes, either from blepharitis or dryness. And a, at least a quarter of patients have visual hallucinations, uh, sometimes associated with medications, but even on no medications, Parkinson's patients do have visual hallucinations. So the common complaints I hear, probably number one is reading problems. Also uh, double vision intermittently, uh, light sensitivity, extremely common and eye strain. So let's jump into this and see what's causing these common symptoms that might be due to Parkinson's. The eye movements that I mentioned are three-fourths of patients have abnormal eye movements. This is actually uh, being looked at. Uh, uh, Michael J. Fox's Society Research Foundation is funding research looking at tracking abnormal eye movements to see if we can diagnose Parkinson's early, early on before all the other uh, motor symptoms uh, are present in the arms and legs. And I think that's a real uh, promising uh, opportunity. And so that's ongoing, which I'm real happy to see that they're gonna be working with neuro-ophthalmologists on that. Now, I'm sure you know that you've been told that Parkinson's is due to a deficiency of dopamine in the cells in the, in the brainstem and in the putamen in the basal ganglia. But, but did you know that dopamine is not just present in the brainstem, it's also present in the retina of your eye as well as the visual cortex. Now that's pretty fascinating. The problem is we don't know what the role is of the dopamine is in the retina and in the visual part of the brain in the occipital lobes. And if there is a depletion of dopamine in Parkinson's, uh, that might be another way that it's affecting your vision that we haven't even really been able to fully explore yet. So that's something in the future that we will be looking at. Uh, what, what is the role of depleted dopamine in these parts of the brain that are less involved in motor movement, but in terms of uh, perception, visual perception. But I think that's just fascinating. Um, there's a very famous lecture that this is based on by a very early neuro-ophthalmologist named J. Lawton Smith, who has been dead several decades, but he, he made a lecture, the first lecture about how Parkinson's affects the vision, and he was very clever, and he used the word Parkinson's for each letter of, uh, of the word, he found a symptom or sign that we can see in Parkinson's patients that affects the vision. So I'm gonna use that as the basis of my lecture. And I'll explain what some of the medical terms are if you're not familiar with them. So the first part, the parkey of Parkinson's is uh, paresis of gaze. That means abnormal eye movements or, or slowness of eye movements. 
accommodation paresis. Paresis means paralysis. That means impairment of focusing, uh, poor focusing. Reflex blepharosplasm and blepharoplegia. That is involuntary excessive blinking, blepharospasm, and blepharoplegia, not being able to open one's eyes to initiate eyelid opening. Keratitis sicca is just dry eye syndrome, very, very common, three quarters of patients. Infrequent blinking, that has to do with Parkinson's stare. The last part of the word, the Parkinson's, in is for no hemianopia, meaning no part of the visual field loss typically. Sensory abnormalities, those will be things like visual uh, hallucinations that we'll talk about. Ocular gyrate crisis is very rare. It's when the eyes get stuck in an up gaze position, usually as a side effect of medications for Parkinson's. No nystagmus or dementia. Well, um, nystagmus is inability to hold the eye still. We don't see a lot of that. So we do, of course, sometimes, we're no, we now know that we do see dementia in Parkinson's. When Dr. Lawton Smith did this lecture several decades ago, that was not known. And then there's some other signs I'm going to highlight that are important. So let me just jump into these and uh, we'll tackle them each one and, and sort of I'll show you some examples of this. The paresis of gaze, what is that? This is what affects reading. The, the eye movements, when we read, uh, we really don't smoothly uh, move across the page. Our eyes jump from word to word and we actually jump over several words. These are called saccades. It's a French word for fast eye movements. And we know in Parkinson's that just like your motor movements are impaired and slow, the eye movements are slow. That means slow hypometric. That means they don't hit their target. They fall short. And uh, there's also a jerkiness of smooth pursuit. If you're following a plane in the sky, that's smooth pursuit. A Parkinson's patient wouldn't smoothly follow it. It might be a jerky, jerky business looking at the plane. We know that carbidopa and L-dopa improves the, these eye movements, slow movements and incomplete movements, but there can be excessive uh, on-off effects, just like if any of you have on-off motor symptoms with, uh, with uh, Cinemet or carbidopa, it can do the same thing with your eyes. The eyes can be excessively too fast with, with the medication and then it wears off and they get slow. So some people notice this, that the actual medications affect their ability to read. So you might time your reading for when the medication kicks in best for you, uh, not just randomly during the day. So uh, my colleague, Joyce uh, Liao at Stanford showed a fascinating thing she took an infrared camera and looked at eye movements of Parkinson's patients. And what she showed was that Parkinson's patients, their eyes don't jump normally when they are reading a paragraph. They, they jump more than they should and they pause on words longer than a normal person would, would. And the result of this is the reading takes a lot longer for a Parkinson's patient and it can be very fatiguing. So this explains why people with Parkinson's often who are avid readers often sort of give up on reading or don't read as much because it's, it's frustrating. It's a brain thing, has to do with the, partially with the eye movement control. So before that, we didn't really understand why is reading such a problem for Parkinson's patients. There are sometimes some other reasons that I'll go into, but this is a major issue with reading in Parkinson's. Now, uh, the imitators of Parkinson's, there are some other movement disorders that are mistaken for Parkinson's. We call them the cousins of Parkinson's. PSP, which some of you may have, cortical basal degeneration, CBD, or olivopontal cerebellar degeneration. And one of the ways we know these aren't Parkinson's is they don't respond to dopamine uh, agonists. And they also have abnormal eye movements, however, all three of these. The next problem is focusing impairment, accommodative paresis. That means you can't focus it near. And not only that, but the eyes which turn inward when you read, in Parkinson's patients who've had it five to 10 years or longer, the eyes often won't turn inward to focus. 
and this can cause double vision only with reading. Fortunately, there are uh, treatments for this with prisms that can help. Some of the medications for tremor can also cause impaired focusing, so we have to be aware of that. The spasms of the eyelids. So there's often one of two things. Blepharospasm is excessive blinking, where you can't keep your eyes open. Here's a lady who is in the next slide, I'll show you. She has her eyes tightly closed and she's trying to keep them open, but they won't stay open. A praxy of eyelid opening is not being able to initiate opening of the eyes, even when they're not spasming. And these patients often have uh, dry eyes as well. Here's a, a lady with blepharospasm. You can see the wrinkles around her eyes from constant squeezing of the eyelids close. And she will tell you this is completely involuntary. She's not able to control the spasms. This is apraxia. This lady is not spasming, but you ask her to open the eyes and she can't. She's using her forehead, in fact, which is wrinkled to try and make the eyes open up using the eyebrows. And then all of a sudden the eyes will open. It's a problem with the signal from the brain to the eyelids not getting through like a short circuit. Very hard to treat, doesn't respond to medications very well, but we have a few tricks for that sometimes. Let's talk about the dry eye problem. I told you this is a very common, maybe two thirds to three quarters of patients have dry eyes. It causes blurry vision, it causes eye fatigue, redness, and a sense of burning sometimes. It can be exacerbated if you have blepharitis, this low grade inflammation of the eyelids. It's commonly associated with seborrheic dermatitis, which looks like this. These patients have sort of a patchy, scaly skin in the scalp or sometimes in the uh, forehead or even on the face. And the dermatologist or your primary care can give you creams or shampoos which will decrease this. The dermatitis exacerbates the dryness problem of the eyes, which then causes blurry, eye, blurry vision uh, from the cornea drying out. So if you have any of these skin issues or scalp, you might want to get on that. It might help your vision ultimately. The next thing to mention is Parkinson's patients don't blink as normally as other individuals. A normal blink rate, if you just time someone, would be all of us blink about 18 times a minute without thinking about it. Parkinson's patients typically might only blink once or twice a minute. Well, you can imagine, what's the purpose of blinking? Blinking, the purpose of it is to lubricate your cornea so that you can focus. And if you're not blinking, your cornea evaporates the fluid on it and your eyes dry out more. So this is the reason why Parkinson's patients have more dry eyes. They're not blinking. Their blinker, their, their windshield wiper of the cornea is not working normally. And that's why we need to use drops more, more digil, uh, diligently during the day and at night. Uh, this, this decreased blinking can also kind of create this uh, Parkinsonian stare. And here's Muhammad Ali with that kind of eyes open super wide. And that's what we call a Parkinson stare with not a lot of uh, facial expression. So that affects the dryness part. The lack of a field cut. A hemianopia is when each eye is missing half of the visual field. We saw this early on when patients were getting pallidotomy for tremor. Now we've gotten so good at the surgery that we don't see it very much. Or if we do, it's just a corner of the vision. I've shown you what that looks like. If you're looking at out as if you're the patient that right upper corner where it's black would be uh, what we might uh, not see that area. It, that's a quadrantinopia. And we see that occasionally after pallidotomy. It can be detected with visual field testing that we do in our office very easily. Let's talk about sensory problems. This is the S of Parkinson's. The, Biggest thing we see is poor contrast vision. What, what is contrast vision? Well, 
Uh, when we check your vision in the eye clinic, your eye doctor shows you typically black letters on a white background. That is 100% contrast, black on white. In real life, under non-ideal conditions, we don't have normal contrast situation, uh, particularly at night. If you drive at night or in a, a dimly lit room and you're trying to read a map or a book, you use a different pathway for low contrast vision. And this is impaired in Parkinson's patients. We have a special chart, which I've shown an example here called a low contrast visual acuity chart. And we project that, we check in our office, both 100% contrast like your regular eye doctor, and then we do low contrast. And what I see is some patients see 20-20 with a normal eye chart, and then we test low contrast and they can't see any letters, not even the big E on the chart. And that tells me that patient's gonna have a real hard time driving at night and perhaps should limit or not drive in the evenings. Also, that patient will benefit from increasing the uh, base contrast on a TV screen and a computer monitor. Some of you don't know, but there is a factory set contrast setting on all monitors. And you can go into your settings of your TV screen, if you have a large screen at home or your laptop, and you can increase the contrast from say, factory setting might be 60% and set it up to 80%. And it'll be easier for you to see the letters and to see more crisply the material on the screen. So this is something we test in our office. If you come in for a visit, we would test low contrast. And it's, it's, we don't know why it's decreased. It might be because of the decreased dopamine. Color vision can also be slightly affected in the blue-yellow zone with Parkinson's patients. And then again, we see about a third of patients with Parkinson's who have visual hallucinations on or off medications. Um, and these can be unformed like colors, lights, or they can be formed hallucinations like animals or patterns as well. It's not, it can be either one. And we know there are certain medications for Parkinson's that more typically show this. This is the rare ocular gyric crisis that you see what that looks like, that it can be seen with certain drugs that are sometimes used for patients. It's a, the eyes are stuck in up gaze and we have to give a medication to get them to stop being stuck in up gaze. Fortunately, we don't see it so often anymore with the newer drugs. So it would be rare that I would see this. The no nystagmus or dementia. Nystagmus is an inability to hold the eye still. It's a bouncing of the eye and it's more common in some of the mimickers of Parkinson's. And of course, I mentioned the dementia, we don't see that often, more typically in older Parkinson's patients. Some of the signs of Parkinson's that the doctor looks for, your neurologist might've done this, they tap on your forehead and we all blink when someone taps on your forehead, but a normal person stops blinking after a few seconds. And in a Parkinson's patient, you can't, you can't uh, resist the blink, it keeps going. Also, Parkinson's patients sometimes have to blink to move their eyes. If they wanna to look to the right, they blink and then look to the right. Normal person would just look to the right, look to the left. If you find you might not realize you're doing this, that you may have to blink in order to change your direction of gaze, that's called Wilson's sign. Can be an early sign of Parkinson's. Okay, in another sort of, this is a cousin of Parkinson's, Lewy body disease, shares a lot of similar motor symptoms, but these patients have a lot more visual hallucinations. Two thirds of them have visual hallucinations and they have visual spatial problems, so difficulty using maps. These are now some of the mimickers. MSA, multi-system atrophy, they have impaired smooth pursuit and they have nystagmus, especially of the cerebellar form. When they look to the side, the eyes won't hold still, they're jumping around. So uh, that's a little bit more than we see with Parkinson's. And in the MSA, the Parkinsonian type, we, uh, we might see this kind of nystagmus too. PSP, in my uh, experience, is the one disorder that is frequently misdiagnosed as Parkinson's. 
and it affects the eyes more profoundly and ultimately the eyes become kind of frozen and won't move around. It affects the vertical fast eye movements, the saccades, and it really interferes with reading early, early on. When I see a patient who's being referred with a Parkinson's that doesn't respond to, to Cinemet, the first thing I think about is PSP and I always ask them, um, are you able to read? And frequently the PSP patient will say, I have not been able to read for six, 12 months or longer. Um, so it's very, uh, it shares the same rigidity and lack of balance, but it's even more profound with balance problems than Parkinson's. I'm gonna show you a little video here of PSP so you can see what that looks like from a colleague of mine at Johns Hopkins. So let me get this thing to play and we'll watch a little bit of it. I don't know if there's audio, but I can walk over it, talk over it. So these patients can't suppress blinking when exposed to bright light. That's the first thing they show, how they put a light on, this patient is blinking, blinking, even though they're told don't blink when the light flashes, they can't help it, it's a, it's a reflex that they can't seem to stop. This is look showing the, the inability to look up. Look down at the floor. Patient's looking down. They can't look all the way down or look up. Look up at the ceiling. Trying to look up. Look down at the floor. Very little vertical eye movement. Look to the right. Better horizontal movement to the right look and back left. Back of the camera. Look to the left. And the eye movements are slow, especially Look vertically. Left. Look back at the camera. This Look is the PSP. Right. Look all the way to the right with your eyes. And you can imagine how reading would be very right. difficult if you can't move your eyes fast. Look back at the camera. So I'm gonna go ahead and jump over that, but that that's PSP, Dudley Moore had it. Uh, my mother's sister had PSP as well, and it was misdiagnosed as Parkinson's in the beginning until we figured out what it was. CBD, uh, some of you may be familiar with, also has problems with blepharospasm, difficulty opening eyes and, and gaze palsies. So how do we manage these eye problems? I wanna give you some positive things. You know, what can we do? Well, we need to take a very careful history from the patient. So we need to find out like, how much time does the patient read? Are they able to read? Why aren't they reading? Are they seeing double? Are you having blurring of vision and it's just not clear? How much time on the computer? Do the medicines, when you take your Cinemed or other meds, affect your ability to read or use your eyes? Are you taking anything that would dry out your eyes, like antidepressants, some of them, or, or the anticholinergic medicines? They can also cause uh, hallucinations. Eyeglasses are really important to talk about with your eye care provider. Uh, to get a really careful prescription. And it's hard to do that with a Parkinson's patient who has movement disorder because the patient has difficulty getting even into the uh, machine to test the vision. It's hard to get your, your head in the proper position to check the prescription for the glasses. Uh, we, Dr. Um, Lawton Smith in the lecture he, he liked single vision lenses. So he recommended patients try to get a pair of glasses for distance and a separate pair of glasses for reading full frame. And then if you need a third one, get a bifocal or a progressive. He did not like progressive lenses only because as you have trouble moving your eyes around, you have a lot of trouble getting into the small window at the bottom to read. And if you can look straight ahead and read with a separate pair of large frame reading glasses, you're way better off. So the first thing I do, if I see a patient in trifocals, I suggest they get a separate pair of reading glasses for computer and reading use that are large frame, not a small frame, but a pretty large frame. Uh, occasionally we'll also let you have a bifocal, but we try to avoid, if we can, sometimes progressive lenses. So I can talk more about that in the follow-up with questions if we need to. Uh, 
also, if you're having double vision at near, you can put these press on prisms on, which will make it easier to focus at near and get rid of the double vision at near. If you're seeing double when you look at text, you might benefit from some prism in the reading glasses. You probably don't need it in the distant, but you might need it in the reading glasses. For the uh, eyelid problems, if you have blepharitis, your eye care provider can teach you how to scrub your eyelids, uh, which I do every morning, with special um, things you can purchase over the counter or uh, through your eye care provider to keep your lids from getting this low-grade infection and you can treat the blepharospasm with botulinum toxin injections. So I have a clinic that does this. This shows a patient with blepharospasm before and after Botox. And you see how she can't open the lids at the top, but in the bottom afterwards, she can easily open her eyelids. So Botox, if you really have blepharospasm, can be very helpful. The reading tricks, because Parkinson's patients lose their place on the page, if you use a ruler or a finger, it can really help keep you from losing your place when you come back to the next line of a paragraph. It also helps to keep the material in front of you with a full frame reading glass. So use a music stand or a cookbook holder like this and keep it at eye level so you don't have to look down. Uh, using computer, you can adjust the font so that it's in front of you as much as possible. It's better than using an iPad and looking down in your lap. It's way better to look straight ahead if possible when you're reading anything up close on the computer or in a book. Much easier for Parkinson's. So these are some of the uh, findings, the signs that we see in Parkinson's. I've tried to go over, some of these are due to motor coordination problems from Parkinson's. Some of them are due to cognitive issues with Parkinson's in the brain and retina. We want to try and preserve vision because it's so critical, particularly when you have poor balance from Parkinson's. And people, of course, enjoy reading. More, now more so than ever with COVID, people are indoors, they're watching television, they're reading, they're using their computers, you're spending way more time probably online. And uh, when you use the computer, you suppress blinking even more than just talking to someone. So it's another source of dryness. So I would encourage you all to get a pair of lubricating eye drops from the pharmacy and keep it next to your monitor of your home computer. Put them in every night when you go to sleep and when you wake up in the morning and then as needed during the day if your vision's getting blurry or your eyes are feeling tired. You need to find a good eye care provider that can help you. Um, I'm happy to do evaluations for some of these subtle signs that your eye care person cannot find or, or doesn't see but we don't do glasses in our clinic uh, at, at Cherry Hill Swedish. We leave the prescription and the general eye care, cataracts, looking at your retina to your regular optometrist or ophthalmologist. But we can tell them some of the things they're missing in terms of the suggestions for reading glasses, the dryness issues. We can give them some good feedback and, and awareness that they're not a, may be aware of when they see you for your regular visits for your glasses and eye care. Um, that's good. I've, I've gotten through a little faster than I expected, which will give us more time for me to address some questions about my lecture content. And I'll stop here and let Jen jump in and see how she wants to handle the question and answers. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Hamilton. And I love that photo of Bryce Canyon. That's where I went on my honeymoon. It was beautiful. Beautiful. Um, so we are gonna open up the, um, for question and answer. Um, there are a little over a hundred people on the line. So let's use the Q and A box um, to type in your questions. So the Q and A is down below and um, it's, should be located on your screen. It says Q and A, and you can type in your answers and I will read them off to you, Dr. Hamilton. And yeah, um, yeah and well, we I'm can- sure, I'm sure some of them are duplicates. People but, want to do the same thing. So I'll let you pick and choose and just, uh, I'll be happy to do my best. Okay, great. 
Well, we have two right off the bat. Um, any additional considerations for um, Parkinson's disease individuals considering cataract surgery? Mm, so cataract surgery uh, normally is now done, in the old days, it was done by uh, an anesthetic that was injected behind the eye, or sometimes people would be put to sleep with general anesthesia. Now cataract surgery is typically done with just topical anesthetic drops that numb the eye, and it, it typically is like 20 minutes or so. It doesn't take very long. So the main concern is uh, as long as the person can hold still, obviously the surgeon does not want a patient that is moving around, uh, that the head is moving around during the procedure. So you'd wanna have that conversation with your ophthalmologist about whether your Parkinson's is mild enough that they feel confident that there wouldn't be any issues with you moving around during the procedure. They do give you often, sometimes they can give you something else like uh, that the twilight sleep that will relax you so you're sort of sleepy during the procedure and that might be just enough so that you're not moving around. In terms of, uh, is there any other reason you can't have cataract surgery? I would say no, not because of having Parkinson's. And in fact, you know, um, once you do cataract surgery, the implants are, are good for life. So, you know, uh, you don't have to do it more than once. Most people have to have a, you have to have a good conversation with your, your surgeon about how you want the new lenses that you're going to receive. Do you want them both for distance? Do you want one for near and one for distance? Or do you want multifocal lenses that do distance and near? My advice would be from working with a lot of Parkinson's patients, probably avoid the multifocal lenses and correct mostly both eyes for distance and then wear reading glasses. I think that's probably the best option for people with Parkinson's and you'll have the least problems with that. I wouldn't do one eye corrected for near and one for distance unless you used to that with contact lenses. If you have what's called monovision for years, you can do that. But if you're not, uh, I would normally recommend both eyes corrected for distance. So you wouldn't need to wear glasses for distance and you would just wear reading glasses or computer glasses. Okay, great. Um, here's a question actually about glasses. What do you think of prisms in bifocals? Um, the, the, well, the, the problem is for Parkinson's patients, sometimes you need a different prism for distance versus near. And if you wear a bifocal, of course, you're wearing one pair of glasses where the top part is distance, where you might need a certain kind of prism. And the bottom part, when you're reading, you might need a different strength prism or a different type of prism. So it depends on um, the, the alignment issue with your eyes. It might work for some, you might be away, able to get away with that, but there are quite a few patients who would need a different strength prism for distance versus near. And that's why I like the idea of a separate pair of computer slash reading glasses with its own prism. Great, great. Um, does ebook make reading more difficult than a hard copy book? Have you seen a difference there with Parkinson's? Um, no, I think that one of the issues is the contrast impairment. And uh, what my patients have told me, there's the, like a Kindle that's the paper white, you can get maximum contrast. Some people even flip it so that instead of black on white, they do white letters on black background. You can play with that. Um, so what you want is uh, you want to maximize or the con you want to boost the contrast, whatever that does for you. And I, I don't know if, if that would be uh, as good as using a Kindle. I think the black on white, you're not going to get better contrast than black and white. So color, it, you know, I mentioned color vision is somewhat impaired in Parkinson's as well. So reading uh, ideally should be black on white or white on black, one or the other. You can try and see what you prefer. Okay, great. Is there a relationship between Parkinson's disease and glaucoma? Um, not to my knowledge, no. Um, now, of course, because both are seen in folks over 50, typically, and they're both common, we, it's not unusual that patients would have glaucoma and Parkinson's. 
glaucoma is a disease of eye pressure and the high eye pressure causes us to kind of silently lose our peripheral vision where we often don't realize it. So it sneaks up on you. But if you get regular eye checks where they check your eye pressures, they can often detect it early and prevent you from losing your peripheral vision. Now the problem, one of the issues about Parkinson's and glaucoma I'll say is people with bad Parkinson's uh, have trouble putting the eye drops in. So, um, Park, uh, glaucoma is treated in the United States usually with eye drops is the first, uh, first thing. In, in, in Europe, they do a, a laser procedure to lower the eye pressure. Uh, it's just personal preference and historical. Now, if you have Parkinson's and you have trouble uh, with coordinating your hands or you have tremor, you might have trouble putting in the glaucoma drops twice a day, you know, it can be complicated. Either you need a caretaker to do it, but you might be able to have the surgical procedure, the laser procedure, and, and you wouldn't have to put drops in. So I think if you get diagnosed with glaucoma and you have Parkinson's, you might wanna talk with your ophthalmologist about would you be a candidate for the laser procedure rather than using eye drops? Because they don't think about these things like, oh, they just assume you're gonna put the drops in or someone will do it for you. And if you can't, and then you're not using the drops regularly, you're going to lose your peripheral vision. Okay, that's a really good, great tip. Yeah. Um, so there's a, it's a question about hallucinations. What, what drugs are likely to cause hallucinations? Um, I think the most common, it's not so much cinnamon as the, uh, the uh, dopamine agonists. Mm -hmm. And there's a whole, there's now the bunch of them. Some of them are patches that people wear. And I'm sure you, you all probably know the names better than I do because I don't treat Parkinson's. But the dopamine agonists have been more inclined to cause this problem. And most of the movement disorders uh, neurologists are very familiar with this. So they're usually, I read their notes when they refer people to us uh, from the clinics at, at UW and, and Swedish and Evergreen and, and Booth Gardner. And they, they're pretty tuned into this. So they, they're, no, they're pretty knowledgeable about that. But, yeah. but I think it, it is common even without the medications, which I was surprised to see. I thought it was always from the medications until I looked into it and actually, there's been some large studies of Parkinson's asking them about visual hallucinations, and it's rather common even in people who don't take medication. And there's a there's a pamphlet on the APDA website, um, a, kind of a short thing about visual hallucinations. So folks okay. can check that out on our website. Yeah. Um, is double vision at longer distances versus close-up vision a common problem with PD? It's usually more common up close at near than in distance. Um, it can be either. Uh, and I'm talking about, I want, I want to, uh, we get referred a lot of patients for double vision. And, and I, want to, I want you all, my, the people who are listening, to uh, make sure you tell your doctor what kind of double vision you're having. If you are talking about seeing double with one eye, which I call ghosting. That's like if you remember the old days when you had a TV with an, a bunny ears, and if the bunny ears were turned the wrong way, you'd see an extra border around people's head and you wouldn't see a sharp image. That's ghosting. That is not double vision, in, in my opinion. Double vision, it go, if you co cover either eye, you see one, one, both eyes, two, either side by side or on top of each other. But this ghosting is an optical distortion. It's usually caused from abnormal uh, lubrication of the cornea, like dryness or blepharitis or cataract or rarely retinal disease, like an epiretinal membrane. True double vision, which you, we call it frank binocular diploma, if you cover either eye, that's an eye alignment problem. That I can help with prism that we can grind into, we can do a trial prism like you saw Hillary wearing a plastic prism in one. And if you like that, then we can grind it into your glasses. If you're talking about ghosting, that's something that your regular optometrist or ophthalmologist can look into. Why are you having it? It's usually either your prescription isn't right, you have dry eyes, you have blepharitis, 
or you have cataract. It's usually one of those four things. And those are all four things that we can do something about with your eye care provider. That's ghosting. I see a lot of people get referred to me for so-called double vision. And when I actually test them, it's not double at all. Their eyes are lined fine, but they're, they're having ghosting. And they just, the doctor didn't understand them. With prisms, um, if you've been using them for a long time, are you going to need to get stronger prisms? The question about that, they use them for um, Yes, yes. So some people have a, a muscle imbalance from childhood, you know, a lazy eye, which means the eye wandered as a kid and it might have been patched. Other times that comes out with like Parkinson's, it just sort of comes out. Yes, what I find is as people age every few years, often the prism needs to be strengthened. Not every year, but maybe every two to five years, you will need a little bit more prism, either for distance or especially for near. The, the inability to move the eyes inward to read uh, tends to worsen in Parkinson's over several years. Okay, okay. A um, couple questions about the eye scrubbing and the eye drops. What are there specific recommendations you have for eye drops for dry eyes? And then what do you use for the eye scrubbing? Well, when I was in training, we were taught that if you have a patient with, what, what is causing blepharitis? Blepharitis is a low grade inflammation of the glands uh, at the eyelashes where they attach to your eyelid, there are glands. And if there is a low grade inflammation from staph, which is a, an organism on your skin, those glands become plugged and you can no longer, the, the oil that normally comes out of your eyelashes onto your cornea no longer comes out. And you need that oil to lubricate the cornea for clarity of vision. So the idea of the scrubs is to keep the staph infection on the eyelashes down by using something that will inhibit this, the organism from growing. I was taught to do, um, baby shampoo scrubs, which is you'd take a Q-tip, put it under warm water, put a drop of baby shampoo, and then you'd rinse out the most of the soap and you'd lightly scrub the lashes uh, after you used a, a warm washcloth on the eyes first, and then you'd rinse the eyes. Um, we found out that baby shampoo can be irritating. So it's not the best choice. Nothing wrong with the Q-tip. So there are products now that are better there is one you can get from your eye care provider. It's, a, it's, a, it's in a bottle called Avenova, A-V-E-N-O-V-A. And uh, that's a spray that I use myself on my Q-tip. I, I wet the Q-tip and I put a spray of the Avenova on and then I lightly scrub. Or uh, online, there's a product called we Love Eyes, which Jennifer Aniston is their spokesperson. <laughs> and it's got tea tree oil in it and some vitamin C and other things. You can buy it on Amazon called We Love Eyes. And it's a little bottle with an eyedropper. And um, you can use the one that's for the eyelashes. And I, I've used that myself and it works qu quite well. Um, it's a little bit more oily than the spray that I mentioned. The Avenova you have to get from an eye care provider because you can't just, I don't think you can buy it online. I would use one of those two over baby shampoo, although lots of people, thousands of people use baby shampoo without a problem. Okay, great. Um, I, I do it every day. So if I don't do it every day, I have dry eyes and blepharitis. And if I don't do it every day, I notice that by four o'clock in the afternoon, my vision is getting blurry and I can't see a sharp 2020 anymore. My vision's getting blurry. Huh, so that leads me into the, a couple questions about blurred vision. And um, one, will cataract surgery improve it? And is there a vision therapy that's helpful with, well, this says double vision, but is vision therapy something that folks can do? Well, the cataract surgery, if your vision is, is affected by cataracts, it, remember a cataract is like a film in the lens of the eye that getting, it's getting more and more opaque uh, that you can't see through. And, and the typical symptoms of cataract uh, when they're ripe or ready to be taken out are when you look at headlights and taillights, you see halos around lights, you see rays of light projecting off of objects that are bright. Uh, that's a typical kind of cataract thing. And we tell people 
it's time, and that would be all day long, you'd have problem with cataracts. It wouldn't fluctuate from morning till afternoon. Uh, the time to do cataracts is when it interferes with activities of daily living. That means you're having trouble uh, reading a newspaper or driving or watching television. Um, and, and it will, usually your eye care provider will know when the cataract's ready to come out. Uh, so you have to trust them a little bit. They, they sometimes wanna do it early before you need to. Uh, what was the second? Oh, the second one was about uh, vision therapy. Oh, vision therapy. So vision therapy is done by optometrists, not ophthalmologists, and the, it's very controversial. It works very well for kids with muscle imbalance uh, who are having trouble with a lazy eye that's wandering. It may or may not work for the problems with reading with Parkinson's because this is a, uh, a brain disorder, right? It's a dystonia, it's a movement disorder. And I've had mixed luck doing it for people with Parkinson's. I think a lot of times it's easier to just do prisms in reading glasses than doing the visual therapy. You can try it, but I, I would be more inclined to just try with the prism itself. Okay, great. So um, I think this is kind of about the depth perception sometimes issues. Um, this gentleman is a welder and he often finds he is 90 degrees off from where he should be welding. Um, he just can't follow a straight line. Is that, is that something that can be fixed with any of these things that you've been talking about? Well, I guess the question would be um, what's going on? He's not seeing double, I guess. He didn't say he was seeing double. Uh, it's not, it's not so, clear, yeah. But sometimes when the eyes are slightly out of alignment, the patient won't say it's double, it's just blurred. They just can't get it sharp. It's not quite enough to be double. Uh, I guess I'd want someone to look carefully at the alignment and make sure there's not a cataract issue. I'm, I'm not sure exactly. Um, I'm not surprised that depth perception is off in Parkinson's patients. That, that doesn't surprise me too much either. Um, yeah, so I mean, you'd wanna look at all these possible issues. Is there an underlying um, alignment problem? Is there cataract? Is there dryness? You know, Is there anything at all that could be fixable that would potentially improve that? Or the kind of what, especially what kind of correction is he using when he's doing his work? Does he have special glasses for just welding that are have the right kind of either prism and uh, the strength of the reading portion? Okay. Um, so you you talked to oh, Because oh. like, like that person needs to tell their eye care provider, I don't just need reading glasses. I'm, I'm a welder. That might be mm -hmm. a different distance than reading. And if the, if, the, if the optometrist is giving you glasses for 16 inches, which is reading, and you're welding at a different distance, they're not going to be ideal. They may be the wrong strength. So different glasses for different activities, which is again. This is, this is a matter of having a conversation and really telling your eye care provider like, okay, when I do this, I can't see clearly. When I'm welding, when I'm knitting versus reading or looking at my computer screen, you know, they need to know what's the distance of your eyes from the, the object you're trying to see. Right, so expressing your goals, not the, not the doctor's goals, it's your right. goals. What do you want to get out of this visit? Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Um, so you talked about progressive lenses in your presentation and about, um, you know, maybe not doing progressives. Um, if someone's used them for years, should they maybe switch? No, I, I think if you're used to them, that's fine. I would still encourage you to have a separate pair of reading glasses with large frames. So I don't know how many of the listeners have seen Iris Apfel, A-P-F-E-L, but she's a, she's a celebrity. She's in her, I think she's 90 years old and she has huge Chanel glasses. And like that, that's an exaggeration, but I'm talking about big frames. Like I have pretty big frames. You don't want these small narrow one for reading. So you want a separate pair of reading glasses with big frames. And a lot of times the eye doctor will say, oh, just go to the drugstore and get a pair. But you know, if you spend a little money and you get a large frame and they give you an exact prescription for you, you can't correct for astigmatism when you buy them in the pharmacy. If you have astigmatism, 
you're never going to see a sharp with a store-bought pair of readers versus a pair that your your eye care provider makes for you and you also maybe not be able to get the right frame you want so a large frame and and um, they can work it out so that it works for both computer and reading that's what i do it's kind of in between but um yeah that's that's what I would suggest. Having a still, having a separate pair for near work. You can use the progressives for going to the store, driving, when you're just going to buy stuff in the market. But if you're going to sit down and read a book for an hour or a newspaper, I would like you to use a separate pair of reading glasses. Okay. There's still a lot of questions and we only have a few more minutes left. Um, maybe if we don't get to some of these, um, we can maybe answer them offline because some of them are very specific to some people. So we'll see if we can get back to you about some of these. Um, there's a couple more about hallucinations and I'm gonna refer that to visual hallucinations to a specific talk on hallucinations. So we do have those. Um, and yes, these slides will be uploaded and sent to you. So um, that was a question. So uh, you talked about dopamine being in the eye um, as well as, you know, Dopamine is, you know, a part, a, a large part of this Parkinson's. Um, does low dopamine affect TV watching, working on the computer, reading immediately, and how long is it effective in the brain? And as a caveat, someone else said um, they don't take their meds after 6 p.m. Would that cause more low dopamine in the eye? I think there's a little confusion about that. Well, we don't know how how much dopamine, how important dopamine is in the retina or in the brain, in the visual cord. We just, we really don't know what the, what the, the consequences of low dopamine in those areas is on vision. We do know that when the dopamine levels are low, when you supplement uh, with pills, that it can cause your eye movements to slow down, which can impair reading. And if you take the medicine, then you get a window, just like you might get a window like, oh, after I take my Cinemet, I can actually do stuff for, you know, if I wait an hour, I've got an hour of good time where I can do things, exercise. Well, that might also be true for reading. I, we really don't know, I, I'm fascinated by it, but we don't know how much the low dopamine affects the vision at the level of the retina, which projects all the way to the visual cortex, of course. In either of those locations, we don't know what the consequences are of depleted dopamine. I hope we will one day, but we don't know mm -hmm. anything. Okay. Um, and let's see. Oh, I'm trying to go through these questions and pick ones that are, you know, general in nature. Um, oh my goodness. Um, is there a relationship between Parkinson's disease and macular degeneration? No, not okay. to my knowledge. Um, macular degeneration does run in families and it's more common in smokers. And if you have a family history of it or you were a heavy smoker, it's good to be on probably one of the vitamins that you can get at Costco or other places that are the for preventing uh, progression of macular degeneration. And you can ask your eye care provider if you don't know, but I don't recommend them for everyone. Uh, you can take them, but you don't need to. But if you have a, a risk, a high risk, then it's worth, or you have early disease that we should definitely be on them. Okay, great. Um, and then let's just go to one more question about um, medications. Um, are there specific medications like Parkinson's disease medications that are more have more common side effects for the eye? There was a specific, specific question about amantadine, but I wanted to make it a little more general. Well, I'd say what I mentioned is the ones that can cause visual hallucinations would be key to be aware of, or the ones that have what we call anticholinergic side effects that that dries out the eyes. That's the big issue. They can they can they can uh, affect your urination and your lubrication of your eyes can be impaired. So those are used for tremor sometimes. So it's always good to look carefully at the the list of meds, you know, in that regard. Okay. And discuss it with your Parkinson's specialist. And um, lastly, if someone 
how, how do I say this? If someone wants to find, if someone is not in the greater Seattle area and wants to find a neuro ophthalmologist, somebody yeah. like you, or find um, a general eye care provider who might have experience with Parkinson's, what would you recommend to them? Well, uh, I'm the chairman of our membership committee of my, prof go to my professional organization, which is abbreviated N-A-N-O-S, NANOS, N-A-N-O-S, NANOS. If you put NANOS and I in or whatever, it will come up. And we have a directory, which the public can access, and you can look up any state, and it will give you a list of the neuro-ophthalmologists who are members of our professional society who are trained neuro-ophthalmologists by city in every state. So if you live in a fairly large city, it's pretty easy to find someone that way. I, I think you ideally should see a neuro-ophthalmologist. Um, it's sort of hit or miss with the optometrists and uh, general ophthalmologists. They may or may not be familiar. Your, your Parkinson's uh, uh, treatment centers, you know, this, the areas of specialization, they may know like they know us at Swedish. And so if you, if you check with your local, uh, if you have a movement disorder center, they're, they're usually fairly knowledgeable about who in the community is, is helpful with this. That's where I would go. Okay, great, great. And we're happy to see folks, if you want to see me or either of my partners for something specifically that you think that you have issues that would be worthwhile. You can have your movement disorders person refer you or your eye care provider. You just need to make sure we know that uh, you have Parkinson's and you're coming for an evaluation. And, and we'd like to get a copy of your most recent eye exam from your eye care providers so we know what your cataracts are or if you have uh, macular degeneracy. So we're aware of all those things when you come in for the visit. Okay, great. Great, and I'll, I'll put links to your clinic in the follow-up email as well. And, and just remind and you, that we don't do general eye care. A lot of people sometimes come in and think we'll do their glasses for them. We don't do the glasses, but we will make recommendations for PRISM and give you a, your, your eye care provider guidance about how to do the glasses and what kind of PRISM to use. Okay, great, great. great. Well, Dr. Hamilton, thank you so much for a wonderfully informative discussion. Um, to those of you that we did not get to your questions, um, I'll try to work with Dr. Hamilton to maybe get a couple answers to some of the really specific things. Um, and I will be sending out a follow-up email with um, the link to the video that will be posted on YouTube, um, as well as a PDF of the slides. Um, next month, um, on the second Tuesday in December, um, which is December 11th, Dr. Rebecca Gilbert will be here um, talking about sleep and fatigue in Parkinson's disease. And she is um, APDA's Vice President of Medical Affairs. Um, and uh, she is a, a, a movement disorder neurologist. So she's gonna be talking about sleep and fatigue. Um, when you exit, you will see a link to a survey um, if you would take a time to just fill out that quick survey and tell us what you thought of the program and any suggestions for future programming, that would be terrific. Um, our website, apdaparkinson.org slash Northwest um, will give you more information about future programs as well as you'll see a banner to that every nine minutes campaign helps fund the Parkinson disease registry. So we welcome you to join us for that. And lastly, I would like to thank our sponsors, Kiawa Curran, Synovian, and Allergan for supporting this program. Um, so their support means a great deal in allowing us to continue to provide the work that we do and the support to people with Parkinson's. So um, thank you all for attending this. We hope that you found this a valuable way to spend your Friday morning. I hope you all have a wonderful weekend. Dr. Hamilton, thank you so much again for sharing all your wonderful, wonderful knowledge. Um, thank, you. thank you, Jen. Thanks, everyone. Yes, thank you. And have a, you have a wonderful weekend, Dr. Hamilton. And so long, everybody. Until next time.